Hi, Assalamualaikum. Welcome everyone to one of our first episodes for therapyformuslims.com. My name is Amna and I'm a licensed mental health counselor, um, licensed professional counselor in Montclair, New Jersey, and I'm the founder of therapyformuslims.com. I'm here today with Fatima Finney, who is also a licensed mental health counselor, um, licensed in both Massachusetts and New Jersey, if I recall correctly from our conversations. Yeah, currently. Um, and Fatima, you have years of experience working with trauma, um, that includes domestic violence, substance abuse. Um, I know that you have a private practice in Boston mm -hmm. uh, for individuals and couples, and you use the internal family systems therapy as your framework for um, yep. helping your clients heal. Yeah. And um, another really important thing is how you um, incorporate holistic wellness into your work with your clients and communities other communities um and you're a certified yoga teacher which i think is absolutely awesome to have that combination um we talk so much about mindfulness um you know in therapy but having that combination i think can be really powerful for both therapists and you know your clients um and the other thing that i just want to mention and, and i'm going to stop and, and let you follow up is that um we, before we started recording, we um, talked about how you've also done a presentation for the Black Muslim Psychology Conference. Um, yeah. Yeah. So before we go into that, I just want to ask you, did I skip anything from your intro? Because, Marshall, there's so much there, and I just want to make sure I got it. Yeah, I think you got it. I mean, you know, at the core of me is doing this therapeutic work, um, primarily with working with individuals um, and some couples, um, but also just, you know, health education is really something that I'm passionate about and what kind of fuels the work and how I do it. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So you and I met in Boston years ago um, when we had first started an organization called Muslim Wellness Advocates. Unfortunately, because of everyone's life you know, changing people, moving. I think primarily I was the one, first one who like left. <laughs> and unfortunately we couldn't continue with it, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm really glad that we have, but like, we still have this connection because, um, you know, I think it's very common for, and I, and I definitely think it's changing, but I think we, in our, a lot of conversations about racism or mental health and racism in the community, um, a lot of the voices turn out to be South Asian and Arab. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a huge disservice because we know that black pop the, the black population community, excuse me, is a big part of our um, Muslim American community and has actually been here first, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a huge disservice to not include that voice um, and yeah. that framework and perspective. Um, and, and so obviously that was, well, Probably not, obviously, but that was one of the reasons why I wanted to connect with you and have this conversation, given everything that's happening. Um, prior to our talking uh, recording, we had um, just touched on something really important that you had said, which was about not stating that it's what's happening in the Black community, but what's happening to the Black community. We were talking mm -hmm. about checking in with everything that's happening. Um, so... However you want to, like, I'm just right now asking you if you want to talk more about that or the part of how we, which I think is obvious, both of them are very important, but the part about how we need to include Black voices in our conversations as Muslim therapists. Yeah, so I could start with uh, my comment about that. Um, and it all goes to where a lot of this, this feels like it's happening, which is on social media. Um, and so I think language is is really important because it really uh, tells or doesn't tell the narrative. And so um, I think even in people's inquiries and, you know, how people are processing, I've been hearing a lot of people like, oh, you know, that's so terrible what's, you know, happening uh, in the Black community. And like, I can't imagine, you know, what's going on over there as if it's this separate thing. And so um, for me, it's like, this isn't happening in the Black community. It isn't this isolated thing that's happening over there. It's something that's happening to it. And by saying it's happening in the community, in the Black community, there's an erasure of who the oppressor is, right? So it's like, this is white supremacy okay. impacting the black community um, and the community at large, right? And so we see how 
this thought of like, oh, that's over there. Oh, it's so terrible that it's happening there that now in these moments of, you know, protests where other people are being impacted, that's when they're, they're all of a sudden waking up. And so, you know, this idea of injustice, if you're not going to respond to it, we all live in this world together. So there's going to be some point where it impacts you. Um, it's better if you kind of deal with it early on, but if it comes to your front door, you have to look at how did I get here? How did this happen? And in many ways for a lot of people, how am I complicit in this? Whether this was in my actual explicit action and allowing this to happen, or even in my silence and my decision to be neutral. Right. That, that's that's a really um, important point about the whole language thing. And I know as counselors, we talk a lot about it, you know, the power of words. And we tell our clients that, you know, you're the one who can shape your narrative, right? That power is with you. And obviously, we don't want to take, um, you know, not take into account the external factors that play a role in one's shaping their narrative. But language is definitely important, right? Um, and I know that I've fallen into that where, you know, I've, I've used the word in instead of to. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, all of this, like, I want to tie it into this, this, what you're saying about the language and how it leads us to a point, part of the language, and um, it also does stem from, you know, this, it can stem from this unconscious erasure of, or this separation, right, of um, your experience versus mine. I think it's important mm -hmm. to recognize that non-Black POCs are also subject to white supremacies, but important to still understand that the ones who have historically been oppressed mm -hmm. is the Black community, because I benefit from the model minority myth as a South Asian mm -hmm. woman, right? Yep. Um, and also because of colorism, I'm on the lighter end of the scale. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, and then I get that, you know, well, I mean, according to the brown community, I'm not on the lighter end of the scale, but I mean, if I'm talking about light and larger, right? <laughs> but I mean, I mean, that's like a whole other topic right there. But my point is that I do benefit from it. Um, yep. So I'm saying all of this because when you had said that we don't, um, like we come to a point where it's like, oh, you know, what you had said towards the end about like, the sense of it's starting all over again or the sense of new awareness, even though it's been happening for so long. Did I miss that? Yeah, no, no, no. So what I was saying with that is, you know, this uh, frustration that I feel um, around, you know, now that this, uh, what happened to George Floyd, you have people who are saying, oh my gosh, how did this happen? Almost as if it is, again, another erasure of all the times that, you know, Black people have been saying this is this is going on, this is what needs to happen, that we still here in 2020 have people, oh my gosh, how could this happen? I can't believe that this is happening. That for people who have been saying, hey, you know, that example of there's a fire in the basement, there's a fire in the basement, then when the whole house is on fire, people are like, wait, how did this happen? It lets us know that you haven't been listening. Because if it's like, I don't even understand you know, how did we get here? It's like, we've been telling you, we've been telling you, we've been telling you. Some people frame it as, you know, I saw an article that said, you know, 10 years of seeing, you know, black death, right? And so that's perhaps speaking to the fact on camera, you know, that maybe we've been seeing these videos um, for that long, but this has been going a long time in this country um, and arguably around the world. Anti-blackness isn't something that is specific to the U.S. I think, you know, a colonial mindset, this idea that white is right and superior permeates all cultures. And so, um, everyone even non-black pocs have that narrative whether you want to acknowledge it or not um and so i think that these moments are really important for people to kind of think about what are the cultural references that you have that that is anti-black right and so i think you know people when you really sit you can understand particularly if you have a word for for black people in your culture like i know i think you put up a post about like these things like really starting to talk about um this and i think for muslims in particular whether you acknowledge it or not from a cultural lens there's no way to deny it from an islamic lens because our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one of the last things he said to us in his last speech was around racial um, understandings, you know, that an Arab is not better than a non-Arab. And why was that there? Because even during that time, 
that was an issue. So you can't kind of deny it, right? You can't really, um, I mean, you can, um, but you also have to deny something else that's really important. So if you're going to say that race isn't an issue uh, in the world, then you have to deny what our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left us with. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's, that's really important about how um, people in the Muslim community, unfortunately, take the, that that is that part of the last sermon and that you know one of the um, most like one of the notable companions was Bilal who, who was um, a black companion he was initially enslaved and he you know is known as um the one who would call do the call to prayer because he has such a, he, you know, he had such a beautiful voice um and you know this it's used as a way of well i believe in him and i love him as a way of saying exactly what you're you know countering that cultural um, racism that exists, right? Um, and I'm just like, what impact do you see as a black therapist or from, you know, or, or, or generally what, within the therapist role or not, like what impact do you feel like this has been having on our um, black American Muslim community when it comes to mental wellness? Um. Well, I think historically, you know, there is this um, convenient recognition of, of Black Muslims, right? So when we want to talk about uh, Malcolm X and what he did, right? Like, people are all for that, right? When we want to talk about Muhammad Ali, right? He was this figure, we love him and things like that. Um, but when it comes to day-to-day, -to -day, you know, speaking up, uh, centering Black Muslim voices, then it's kind of this whole, this other thing, right? And so I think that the impact, again, in, you know, Black people, Black Muslim people, there's a resilience here that's kind of like, we get it, we've seen it, and so we have to kind of operate and make sure that we are, you know, protecting ourselves when this happens. But the frustration that happens is the inherent contradiction, particularly with Muslims, right? So right. if we are, on one hand, we're saying we're all one ummah, uh, we want for our brother what we want for ourselves, uh, you know, we want to bring up the ha hadith about you know, if one part of the body is ailing, then it's all ailing, right? But when mm. we see what's happening to Black Muslims, it's kind of like, oh, well, there's something different. Oh, well, you know, they cause this for themselves. Or mm -hmm. if they just do X, Y, or Z, then their situation uh, would be different. Then it's like, well, you can't have it both ways, right? You can't, mm -hmm. you know, reference the guidance in Islam about how you're supposed to stand up for justice, how you're supposed to do mm -hmm. this when it's convenient for you, but then it's a different story when you're actually called upon to do it. Um, and so I think that's the impact where it kind of just creates even more of these divides um, and a lot of mistrust within the community because it's like, well, you say one thing, right? You're hearing your YouTube videos and you're seeing one thing, but when it actually comes time to show up, it's a whole different thing, right? We right. want to just pray about it versus, you know, what Allah calls us to do. You pray and you have action, right? You have that mm -hmm. faith and then you go out and you actually do something about it. Right. But oftentimes, just, you know, we have to not only just pray for Black Muslims or Black people, oftentimes it's we have to pray for them and then everybody else in the world, right? It's always a, it can't be a specific focus, even when there's a specific uh, threat uh, that we see, it always needs to be um, qualified with the suffering of everyone else in the world. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, definitely seen that. Um, and, you know, it's the, the part about that you're saying about this the mistrust and the divides, the word that comes up for me is like this, and, you know, and when you said convenience, it's like this, um, the other, the, the othering, the alienation, and not really being inclusive of like air, an integral part of our community, right? And mm -hmm. from a wellness perspective, um, we believe that having a sense of belonging in a community, family, you know, that's, you know, that is key to mental wellness, right? It's mm -hmm. part of the mental wellness wheel um, to have this sense of I belong and I'm accepted um, mm -hmm. and you know so one having to deal with that both in society at large and then also from a, a community that as you're saying has these contradictory uses one 
you know, stuff in the past that has a lot of send them, but then acts in a totally different way, right? Um, so you have that as part of the mental wellness. And also, like, the racism, like the constant, like the impact of racism on immense, like mental wellness, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to hear more about that from you, like your perspective on that. Yeah, so I think that, you know, from as being therapists, what we understand about the impact of, of trauma. So to be a, um, a black person, particularly African American uh, person, descendant of people who were enslaved and brought over here, like that particular experience um, is a history of trauma. It's a history of repeated trauma throughout generations. And we're now um, living in different iterations of the same issue, right? So no, we're not in slavery anymore but as you um look at the systems and society and the way that it's set up the same uh intention that allowed slavery to happen is the same intention that's allowing you know these systemic injustices to happen so if you're looking at the police brutality in and of itself so the same thing is at play even if the tools and the methods that's being used look very different um mm -hmm. and so oftentimes people get fooled um, and I think it speaks to an education piece. So in wellness, um, as providers, one of the main things that we, the core of what we do is that we're tasked with being knowledgeable, right? We had to go and get degree. We had to learn how to do this work. And we're also taught that our work, our learning didn't end with our getting our master's, right? So we have continuing education because there is always something to be learned, whether it's about a symptom, whether it's about uh, the person you're working with and where they're coming from. And so I think that, um, the impact of the trauma specifically for Black people is that it's still happening in real time, right? So oftentimes when you're thinking of like, oh, this person is coming in to tell me about something that happened to them, for Black people, it's happening now. Like it's happening, you know, if you're meeting with clients this week, like they are off, they are feeling what happened last week or maybe even yesterday because we even see what we talk about george floyd but there's been other people who were killed in the protest there's been other people who are killed so it's, it's this repeated thing and the impact of that we just know from our basic trauma work that trauma breaks down the the body trauma impacts the nervous systems trauma impacts people's ability to kind of uh show up as their full selves because they're always in survival mode and so it's taking their lives away from them physically actually by killing them but then robbing them of the opportunity of just being whole yeah yeah um so what is that because you you mentioned something important about how it's in, that that therapists need to like mental health providers need to continue with you know um, getting education or being educated on these topics right um and you know, I, I, I think that unfortunately a lot of grad programs don't put as much emphasis as they should on, um, you know, the, the, the importance of multicultural awareness. Um, but what, what can we, like, what can us Muslim providers who, mental health providers who are going in, seeing our clients, um, what's the best support or, or how can we truly be there for our clients who are part of the black Muslim community or even just the black community? Yeah, um, I think to begin is to start with yourself and recognizing to what extent are your ideas, are your beliefs contributing to uh, the oppressive systems that are weighing down on these people, right? So if mm -hmm. you find like not just saying because oh i'm a therapist i'm a good person mm -hmm. that's all well and good not just saying because i you know want to be good in this doesn't mean that you are good in this i think taking some real um take a real look at yourself and kind of say where, where do i fall on this and having compassion for yourself because you need to be compassionate in order to be honest with yourself where in what ways do i hold up, do i hold this up whether it's because i'm neutral whether it's because i you know um do have some thoughts that oh if you know 
you know, black people just do this, maybe it would be different. And where are the gaps in my own knowledge that's maybe mm -hmm. contributing to my own ignorance, right? That's a huge thing that oftentimes people don't want to do because it's easier to just say, well, I have good intentions, then I'm just going to do this. However, in a therapeutic space, um, you're not supposed to cause any harm. And even though you're not hitting someone, you're not insulting someone, you're probably not cursing your clients out, it doesn't mean that you're not doing harm by way of microaggressions, by, you know, belittling and dismissing their experience um, uh, under the guise of kind of clinical assessment, right? So calling their, you know, fear of going out, you know, an irrational fear, right? And like now you need to just do some exposure therapy. Like if you're not talking about the system in which they are scared to participate in, then you're causing harm. Because yeah. oftentimes, even still, many people come to therapists seen as the expert. And so your evaluation and your suggestion, um, even when very ill-informed, can be taken as truth, right? And so now you're having this person think that their thought of going outside is irrational. Um, that's causing harm. Um, or even worse, they can decide, huh, you know, that's what my therapist is going to tell me. Like, they didn't even ask me anything, they just start to, you know, judge how I'm feeling, therapy may not be for me. And there's so many people, I think, going to what we were talking about before we recorded of, one, people not being able to find therapists, two, when they do the fit not being there, and then people having these experiences, first session, second session, that really turns them off, that is um, not so much that the therapist doesn't have the clinical skills in general, but they didn't do their work specifically to check their own biases and let alone to really um, learn what is the experience of a Black person in American society mm -hmm. today. Not what I think it is, but what mm -hmm. actually is it? And I think there is this duality between uh, individual knowledge as well as general knowledge. So therapists can, you know, take uh, cultural competency, read books, contact, you know, follow a therapist in this space who are doing um, anti-blackness, racial trauma work to get a sense of it. But then you also want to learn from your client, right? Because you also don't want to be on the other side of the spectrum mm -hmm. where they come in and you're just like, oh, I know your plight is so bad. Everything is so mm -hmm. awful for you. And they're like, now you've hijacked my narrative and you went the other way of just, you know, pinpointing me as just this terribly poor, you know, thing to be pitied. So you want to find that balance of like general knowledge, but still allow them to tell you how they exist within it. I really appreciate you saying that because that's one of the things that we talk about, about how you don't, one within from within the therapy setting, but outside that the onus should not be on black individuals and POCs to educate others, right? Mm -hmm. um, that it's my job to find out more, as you're pointing out, reading up on, you know, white supremacy and institutionalized racism and, um, you know, how our, our community, our larger society, our Muslim community has um, perpetuated those, you know, inequalities, right? Yeah. Um, and, but at the same time, right, it's like, you, like you're saying, find that balance where you do the work, so that your client doesn't have to be the one who educates you about, mm -hmm. well, you know what? No, I always have to experience this because I'm a, you know, I'm a black individual. Um, versus reading up and saying, yeah, this is this this is part of this structure that they have, you know, individuals have to face from that community. And they, so so, but finding that balance, like you're saying, right? So as therapists. What I'm hearing is that we want to make sure that we're educated, but at the same time, letting our clients have the space to talk about their experience while also letting them know that we are educated and not yeah. saying it for them. Yeah. And I, and I also want to speak to the fact that, you know, I, I've worked in community mental health um, at an agency for years, and I saw this kind of phenomena where as therapists, you know, I think you need to think about where you're, around what situations and around what clients your kind of years of training and knowledge and education all of a sudden just evaporates and you don't know what to do, right? So mm -hmm. if you are, because there's a certain energy towards certain topics that for me, I'm just kind of like, why is this a different thing? You know, bring that same energy, like if you 
had a client and they were dealing with um, suicidal ideation, right? You would say, okay, I need to know a little bit more about this. I haven't dealt with this before. I'm going to go take this training. I'm going to talk about this in supervision about ways that I can do this. I'm going to, um, you know, do some safety planning. I'm not going to, you know, go in and decide, well, you know, are you really suicidal? Is that really worth being suicidal? Like, we just hit it with a different kind of energy. I need to know this. This is important. There's no question about it. And But when it comes to, oh, I'm dealing with this type of person, it's like, geez, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, you got a whole master's degree. Like, don't, you know, even that is an indicator, right? So like, again, checking those biases. Why does my whole training, my sense of knowing go out the door with just this kind of person, right? Mm -hmm. That's an indicator of like, well, maybe there's some other things does not make sense. Same way that if you were dealing with, you know, any type of symptom, any type of just person, and they're saying, I, you know, they're talking about experience you don't know about. Like if they're talking about, you know, infidelity, you never really work with that. Like you're just like, okay, I want to figure this thing out. I want to know what's going on. Now it's just, we're talking about racial oppression. We're talking about, you know, systematic injustices. Next step is like, hey, let me go find that out. Let me, you know, Google things, right? But oftentimes it's like, I don't know what to do. Let me go talk to this other black person. Even though it's not like I'm working with a suicidal person, I don't know what to do. Let me go talk to another person who's suicidal. It doesn't work that way. It's like you're you're charged with using the same knowledge. And um, I believe I believe people are capable. And I just want to mention, like, you are capable. You do this all the time. But if there's a stop within your psyche, you really want to examine that and ask yourself, why? Why is this mm. so different when I am able to do it for other things? I can take the trainings. I can um, read the books. Um, and I can, you know, be with my client and particularly ask about the experience. But I think you're right. Clients and therapy is not the, the space for therapists to be educated on general knowledge you only need to be educated on how the individual is there and to not to fall into this sense of like i'm sure you know i'm giving them space to talk about what they need to talk about when it's really you looking to them to educate you like that's also an indicator of mm. oh yeah i have work to do yeah yeah and um what, what you were saying earlier about recognizing why do people in certain situations, focus on the client informing them how much of that is part of their bias, right? And their discomfort with, yeah. with having that internal dialogue of, you know, am I anti-racist? Am I a passive, you know, passively against racism? Um, do I still have seeds of racism within me, right? Mm -hmm. um, so and the I, answer I, is probably, you know, get like the, we, I think, have to all acknowledge that if we're all living under this system, that we have internalized some of these ideas. And that's why I talked about having comp a compassionately honest conversation with yourself of, mm -hmm. oh, yes, I do have, because that's the only way that you're going to be able to deal with it. But if you are, th you know, cutting yourself off from your own truth, there's no way to deal with that. And you're, go you're inherently going to cause harm because that's going to show up in a room with your client. Right, right. So, so one, it's... Um for therapists to increase their knowledge, right? Increase their awareness, recognize their biases through compassionate conversations with themselves, honest, compassionate conversations with themselves. And um, and if it helps other other um, therapists who are willing to do this work of anti-racism and exploration. Yeah. yeah. What else, like, because I'm part of some therapist groups on Facebook and it's just interesting to hear of how some therapists, and which I don't obviously espouse at all, are like, oh, well, don't bring it up. It's the client's agenda. If they don't bring up what's happening, you know, or how it's impacting them, then we're not supposed to bring it up, which is just does not make any sense to me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you have some who are like, you know, or actually what you and I had talked about earlier was about the question of checking in and, and how that question, like how do we phrase that? So I guess what I'm trying to say is are there suggestions for how we can as therapists um, approach this and, and, and be there for our clients as we work on our biases and increasing our awareness? Yeah. Um, yes. And so I, in the way that I work, I, you know, I think using I use myself a lot, so I, I will say that I am a therapist that will 
talk about how I'm feeling as a, as a way to kind of check in with people, right? Because I do think that there needs to be, there is a certain kind of leadership in a, ther in a therapeutic space. And so I do feel like with something like this that is happening, it feels like it's happening to everybody, just checking in with them with it, without robbing them of the opportunity to let the, the conversation go where they want. So that can look like, you know, hey, I just want to check, I want to check in to see if this is worth speaking about and you can determine if it is. Um, there has been a lot going on in our nation around police brutality protests and this can bring up a lot of different feelings. And I just want to check in to see if you have any that you want to talk about or if there's something else you want to talk about. Because one, you're putting it out there for uh, some people who don't care to talk about it, it's like, all right, no, I don't want to talk about that. Okay, cool. I've acknowledged it, though. It's been put in a room, and it, if they want to circle back to it, it's already there. Um, whereas if other people who maybe do want to talk about it, but we know that there are, you know, clients who care a lot and think a lot about their therapist. And so they may want to talk about, but maybe you all haven't even done the work to ever talk about race before. Maybe you haven't even laid that foundation with a lot of people don't, that how do I then bring this thing in a room, right? Mm -hmm. Then you add the layers of maybe we're not even the same race, right? That things get much more complicated that I think that it's the responsibility of the therapist to like put it all out there and allow the client to pick it up or put it down or ignore it if they see fit. But to not acknowledge it, to not um, say anything about it, I think really limits the opportunity at rapport. And I think say it not just for Black people, say it to every client, mm -hmm. right? Because again, we all exist in the same thing that's happening and it may land differently for different people, right? So, you know, if some people are like, oh, do I talk about it? Because um, I'm also in some of the similar groups. Like, how are you dealing with like your, you know, white clients with their, it's like, talk with them about it. You know, that's pretty much probably one of the biggest issues is that people aren't talking to white people about what's going on. And so they're allowed to exist outside of this thing that they are uh, propagating just with their behavior or just with their um, denial of it all. So I think right. bringing it up to everybody, like this is just something that's happening because you know, I was, what, I don't know, a kid probably back then, but a, a kid definitely back then. But when, you know, 9-11 happened, right? Was there a different thing? Was that okay, more okay to bring up? Were you talking more about that because you know that it impacted the world, right? The same mm -hmm. thing is happening now because this is literally impacting the world. We have protests across the globe related to this. So to mm -hmm. not bring it up and allow space for clients to talk about it again or not talk about it because I don't think that just because it is happening, a client has to talk about it. The things that are pressing, mm -hmm. pressing in their lives, that's, I mean, that that's what they're being, that's what they're paying for. So I also don't think that like it says anything that they don't talk about it, but as therapists, I think it's our, it's our responsibility to give people the space. And that's what it really means to give people the space to do it. It's not just like, hey, I'm here, say whatever you want. T let them know, remind them that, okay, yes, it is, it is possible to talk about race with me. It's, it's possible to talk about spiritual, spirituality and faith. How is this impacting your faith? You know, like how is this thing that a lot of people feel helpless? Like making sure that you are, again, reminding people that this is their space and that these topics are there. Otherwise, how will they know? Right, right. And that goes back to that, um, the work that as a therapist, you know, the work that as therapists we need to do about, you know, is there discomfort with us bringing up this, you know, how are things affecting you now? Or do you want to talk about it? Um, yeah. or I want to check in with you, right? And so one, again, understanding if you are hesitating to do, to do that, why are you hesitating, right? Um, yep. And also, um, you know, you, when you said about how like, there's a leadership element to the therapeutic relationship, um, you know, we all want an egalitarian relationship, ideally, with our clients, right? Like where we're both, you know, like, we, we say you're the expert on yourself and I'm the expert when it comes to the knowledge and the clinical stuff, right? But you're right. There is this element of, is it safe for me to say it? Can I mm -hmm. trust this person? Um, mm -hmm. you know, with something so loaded, right? And I think a lot of times therapists, and I've noticed this with earlier, ther you know, therapists early on in their career, unfortunately, I mean, it doesn't matter where they're at, where if the therapist, if the client doesn't bring it up, oh, it must not be an issue, 
Um, and I remember when I was like fresh out of grad school, um, I had a client where um, there was a huge age difference between us. And mm. um, there was something so off about our relationship. And I, and I couldn't pinpoint it. And I wasn't sure if it was because I was, you know, therapist that they had to get transferred to. Um, you know, I, I just couldn't tell what it was. Right. Mm -hmm. And when we were terminating, um, and I was also fresh. I mean, I just graduated from, you know, grad school. So oh yeah. I remember those days. <laughs> you know? Um, so everything was like, Oh my God, what am I doing? Uh, I mean, technically you should still have that kind of like, you know, awareness. But, yeah. Um, after the like, towards, I think it was towards the end when we were terminating or at some point later on in the relationship, he mentioned that he had a hard time listening to me in session. Cause he was like, how could somebody so young? know what I have gone through mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and I still remember that because in that moment I was like oh my god like I just assumed that it could have been so many other things yeah. when you know it would have been so helpful if I had just checked in and said how yeah. is it for you to work with someone younger than you mm -hmm. you know or how is it for you to work with someone who is not part of the black community or uh, it was not, you know, black individual or somebody who is part of the South Asian community, which, you know, has this, that from your experiences, from what you shared before in therapy has, you know, led to a lot of racist experiences for you. Yeah. Right. Um, and so going back to what you're saying, that layer of therapists knowing how their identity, right, um, impacts the, 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 the rapport. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, plug for IFS, that's why I kind of have that as a framework because that model and the whole training is all about therapists getting to know their own part. Because the frame is like, if you don't know your own system, you're walking in with that system in the therapy space and being able to be comfortable enough with what it is that you need to deal with. Because if you're not, it's going to be responding to whatever is inside of your own client, right? And so mm -hmm. this idea of like, if you have, you know, as uh, when I think about some of my early experiences, I had to recognize that I had um, some respectful parts to people who were older than me, right? And so I had to, mm -hmm. I had to get over this idea of like, well, I can't say that because they're older, you know, like I have this part of like, am I being respectful if I kind of really call them out or point this thing out? And it's like, I needed to recognize that I had that because it, and essentially it wasn't giving my older clients that I was working with, because I was like, you know, in my twenties working with people who were like in their fifties and sixties, it wasn't giving them the full experience that they needed because I was just dealing with my own stuff of just like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like, well, how do I say this thing? And then oftentimes not saying mm -hmm. it because something completely separate from my work as a therapist was showing up of like you respect your elders you try to think about these things too where it's just like no the therapeutic space that's where my leadership comes in right like i'm mm -hmm. a therapist i'm in that role i need to say i need to say that and so i think that it's a, it's a wonderful example um what you said because a lot of those things again as the therapist you have to be aware enough within yourself you have to be confident mm -hmm. enough within yourself and you have to be um clear enough within yourself to know that however the client reacts to what you say is their stuff and that's what you're going to be working with right so yeah. you know i say even in the first introductory sessions which i've i've started to incorporate mine is that i talk about like you know i'm a muslim woman i'm, I'm a black identified muslim woman um i I'm a therapist, I'm open to talking about spirituality um, in this space, whatever your faith is, like this is something you could talk about. Like we can talk about race, we can talk about all of these different things, putting it out there so that then later on, if something comes up related to that, it's like, oh, it sounds like that's what we need to talk about. Like you already mm -hmm. plant the seed so when it comes up as it will, it's there for you to do. But if it's just like, I'm a therapist, you should just talk to me because I have these letters behind my name mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. should tell me what it is that you should do. It's like again, it's that duality. There is this, let the individual lead, but then it's also, well, you do have the knowledge, like I'm coming to you and we get this a lot. People are like, well, well tell me what I need to do, right? Okay, and there's okay. some truth in that. Like you have your degree, like tell me a little bit based on what I'm telling you, what it is that I should do or what you're seeing or what you're knowing and clients really value that. But right. I think oftentimes therapists 
uh, you know, hide behind the oh, it's their space thing, um, thinking that they're, you know, convincing themselves that it's in service to the client when it may actually be a protection from within themselves. Right. Like, I don't want to. So, yeah. you know, yeah. if they don't bring it up, then I'm not going to bring it up. Right, right. And um, I actually also, in my, during I think the very first session towards the end, or, um, you know, making sure that there's enough time, um, I, I, I tell clients, you know, like, this is your space, and this is your time. And, you know, there are, um, you know, and, and, and that the relationship is very important. And there may be times, like, if there are times when you feel like I've misunderstood you, or I've judged you, or I've said something that's hurtful, um, you know, it's fair game and you're right to bring it up and let me know so we can talk about it. And, and I also understand that that can be hard, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm a therapist and you may not want to. And if I sense that there's something in our relationship that's changed or you're holding back, I will bring it up too. But it's just, this is a space, like I, I, you know, wanting them to know I mean, because we're, we're human, therapists like screw up too, you know, there have been times when, you know, I'm sure it's happened to you too, when you walk out of session, you're like, oh crap, I could have handled this differently. Yeah. You know? um, and, and going back to the client and saying that as part of what, you know, builds rapport. But I mean, this is like, to we're going in a totally different direction. I mean, obviously we're totally like nerding out on this we stuff. Because we therapists and we talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but, but going back to what you're saying, so I, I'm curious, let's just say, because unfortunately, this will happen, um, or can happen, that there is some Muslim yep. therapist who says, you know, uh, oh, well, if the client says something, right, like, you know, this has been my experience in the Muslim community with South, South Asians or Arabs, right, uh, like black uh, individuals explaining their experience. Um, and the therapist says something like, well, you know, I just want you to know that I believe, you know, I take to heart what, I mean, obviously they probably aren't going to say this tone. And so I probably, yeah. you know, I'm just trying to exemplify that, like you know, yeah. I mean, point out, but if they say, you know, well, I believe, I don't believe in that because the Prophet Sallam said this in his last sermon and I believe in Bilal, and, and what, how, like, when I think about that, when somebody is, you know, saying that to my, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is that how effective do you think that is and how, how like, can it, in my, from my perspective, I feel like it could potentially harm and take away from what the client is saying because it comes across as defensive. I, I don't know. I'm curious to hear your perspectives on this. Yeah, I think in that situation, if someone, if a client is, uh, the black client is telling you about their experience, a uh, black Muslim client is telling you about the experience in the Muslim community, your role as a therapist is to hear it out. And I think, again, when you recognize a part of you getting defensive, that you need to check that part, right? You need to own that part, but you need to know that this isn't the place to address it. And your client is the person mm -hmm. to address it with. That's where your supervisor comes in, or if you're licensed, that's where you do your peer support and recognizing that, oh, I have this stuff because you and what you think and what you feel has nothing to do with the client. Right? right they're not coming with you they're not coming to you to say hey go do this and you know change the community your role as a therapist right now is to hear what they have to say and validate the experience as it is of course you can ask questions in terms of it but you want to make sure that you're asking questions again from that place of how do i be in best service to them versus having any agenda toward them well i want to get them to see that it's not so all south ages well i want to get them to see that this mm -hmm. is it's like check what your agendas are. Your only agenda should be, how do I provide space to this client? How do I work so that they are able to enact whatever behavioral change that they're coming to do? That's what, that's your only, that should be your only agenda. Now, of course, biases show up, but you need to have a protocol for how you deal with that, right? When clients say things that trigger you for whatever reason, have in your mind, okay, let me earmark that because that's my stuff as a therapist and this mm -hmm. isn't the space for me to kind of do that. You can't say like, oh, okay, let me, you know, I'm going to have to take a minute to kind of take that in. That was a lot. Right. That's okay to say and do. Take that moment, but then, you know, earmark your stuff, but then you go back and you service that client and hear more about it because it can be an opportunity, particularly if it's a different experience from you, to learn something. This is the individual knowledge that I talked about. Like now you're hearing about what it is like for this individual person walking in their community, walking in the world, and you want to take notes. Mm, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so it goes back again to that, having that awareness, knowing your stuff. Um, you know, uh, by the way, your your plugs for internal family systems. Every time yes. I hear you talk about it, I'm like, I gotta look into this. <laughs> so it's working. Your plugs, ba basically. <laughs> um, but it, it's so true <laughs> that that awareness and willing to challenge ourselves on an individual basis, mm -hmm. and and also it's so important for us therapists to challenge each other, right? Mm -hmm. like if a therapist says something that's you know unethical or minimizing of a client's experience um racially toned and they're like oh i didn't mean it that way we need to speak out and say that yeah say that. Um, absolutely but i want to oh, i'm sorry go ahead oh i would just add that you know you mentioned how like you know therapists we're people like we have our own stuff and it's just like we do and then carrying a lot of other people's um uh experiences with us we need to be doing that work like i said peer supervision uh, peer consultation, but also doing your own therapy. Like you, once you recognize this, there's a space where you need to do that because that agenda that came up that needs to be defensive, that came, like that came from however you were brought up, like your experiences. And so I just want to also have a plug for that. Like it's, it's, it's very risky, I think, for therapists to be doing this work without some kind of support with, and without someone that's really going to hold a mirror to you. Not just, you know, groups that's going to, you know, say that, oh, poor you, you know, you're doing a good job, keep doing a good job, that client was just X, Y, or Z. It's like, no, where are the people who are going to hold you accountable for, you know, maybe that client was X, Y, or Z, but this is the work you signed up for. In what ways did you actually get defensive and point you in a direction for you to really deepen your work as a therapist and not just give you lip service and not just pat you on the back, even when you're being problematic? Right, yeah. Yeah, that's that's going back to that whole challenging, um, and and again finding that that where you don't look to just your fellow black therapists colleagues to be the mental health providers to be the ones who challenge you, yeah. right? Because again, you're putting the emotional labor. You're expecting them to do the emotional labor. Um, yeah. So, and and, and you know, I, I wanted to go back to something you were saying about. Um, like w about the the when a client comes in and well actually let me let me rephrase because I forgot the exact words but what role do you feel that we Muslim therapists can play in um, fighting the the racism within our community and amplifying black voices what can how can we therapists help in that shift um, <clears throat> I think that so in the role as a therapist um again going back to that knowledge making sure that you are um knowledgeable of yourself and then knowledgeable of resources so if you have someone who is in need of something like knowing about particularly in the muslim community so there's like you know the muslim um um anti-racism coalition like muslim arc like they have following them on uh instagram because they're doing really um great work in this sphere, right? And so um, one way to amplify those voices is to actually want to know about them, but then to actually listen to them, right? So listening to the, the webinars that they're doing, looking at their mission statement, following them, because oftentimes, again, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, what do we do? Oh, we, we should, we, it would be great if we had this stuff. And it's like, there are people already with boots on the ground. Like Muslim art exists and it's been mm -hmm. existing. Like, you know, then the knowledge of like, what is the history? What is the experiences of, uh, black Muslims, like there is Zapello Square, which is this online kind of content creation that's also on Instagram, but it's centering black Muslim voices. And it's just like, you know, one of the things I like to say for people in these moments where they're like, oh my gosh, like what to do, I need to kind of do something. As Muslims, we know that the best deed, the best good deed is the one that's consistent. So when you're asking what to do, you're asking for the long haul, right? It's not just like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to follow Muslim Ark and now I'm done. It's like, follow it, listen to them, understand what they're asking. Oh, you got muted. No, I can't. Can you hear me?
Can you hear me or no? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just okay. gonna say straight off, I am not editing this out because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, but what I was saying is one way to kind of what you can do is um one, I said that individual knowledge, like you really do need to check within yourself. Um, because I feel like sometimes people want to do the external thing, like, oh, let me click, let me follow and do all of this, but it doesn't serve anything if you're still holding racist ideas or anti-black ideas within yourself, right? Like it just creates this dissonance that's going to rupture over time. Like you're gonna be that person who's like out there doing the work and then one day it's just all, all gonna explode because you haven't done your work and you really still harbor these ideas. So I doing the individual work, reading books. I think that there's um, a lot of resources online, interestingly enough, um, pointed particularly white people in a direction of like a whole list of books that you can read from white fragility to, you know, white supremacy and me and everything in between that. I would say, you know, even if you aren't white and you are um, POC, but not black, read those things too. Cause you can also learn it. Cause you can also, there are also ways that yeah. you internalize white supremacy, white mm -hmm. oppression to see, okay, in what ways have this kind of colored my thinking, right? Like read those, all those books as well. Um, but then also I think following and centering Black Muslim voices as you're doing interviewing um, Black people and then following the, the work that people are already doing online um, mm -hmm. and listening to what is being said. Like I can't, uh, I saw a video of, you know, um, of protests. There were these two white women who were painting like Black Lives Matter on a Starbucks and the uh, people called came to him and said, like, you know, stop doing that. That's not what we need. And then he turned around and said, like, hey, no, but we're helping you. And I was like, that's kind of the classic moment of if you're saying you're helping someone and they're telling you that's not helping, you mm -hmm. can't come back and say, oh, yes, it is. You know, like, right. listen to what people are telling you versus, well, go into something and saying, well, this is how I want to show up. This is how I want to do it. How can I find a space for me to exist the way I want to in this? That's not the work. Like right. go into these spaces, finding out what it is that I can do and listening, um, preferably the first time. Right, right. Um, so, and, and again, this is mirrored from what you were saying about in our personal work as therapists, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I think also um, including pushing for mosques when they have mental wellness, you know, making sure that there is an individual from mm -hmm. uh, the black community to talk about mental wellness, right? um so and consistently yeah. too right? right 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 black voices are valuable period they're not just valuable for black experiences so right. you know right. again like that consistency is not just oh yeah let's go get a black person because it's february black history month right like right. black people exist in these communities the whole time so those voices should be represented 24 7 right. 355 right rather than right. let me go yeah. cherry pick this person for this particular thing yeah and I remember that was actually one of our goals for Muslim Wellness Advocates. We wanted to make sure that it was, our board was diverse because we were yeah. worried that we would lose voices in the process, yeah. right? Um, so, so basically as a overview, as therapists, giving our clients, one, working on ourselves, doing a lot of aware, inner awareness work and um, anti-racist work, you know, challenging ourselves and our beliefs, um, mm -hmm. reading up, being informed, um, mm -hmm. being consistent, right, um, supporting, and, and these are more of the individual stuff, but for therapists who want to also do this, you know, supporting different causes and being consistent in that support and doing it on a large, you know, macro level, um, but also for us as therapists, giving our clients the space to talk about what's happening for them. Um, yeah. And, and I would say actively giving them space. So actively, passively giving them space is like, what do you want to talk about? The space right. is yours. I'm going to wait for them to say everything. Actively is saying like, you can talk about all these things here. You can talk about anything. Here are some examples of what I actually mean by that, right? Because anything right. can feel vague and overwhelming to people of like, wait, what? It's so big. So you want to get specific about like, yeah, you want to talk about this. You want to talk about what's happening on the news. There's space for you. There's space for you to do it, and a space for you not to do it if you don't want to talk about it. Because mm -hmm. not everybody wants to talk about it. Because they're probably talking about it so much in their regular life, they actually want a place to be able to talk about everything else when they finally get to you. Um, right. So I think being able to do that, and I think advocacy is important as well. Because again, clients are coming to us wanting to know what can they do.
therapist. So as a therapist, you need to be informed, right? And so are you, I would say what's important for advocacy, the same way that we want to advocate for, you know, better insurance rates to pay us and, you know, mental health parity. And we're talking about legislation and trying to get laws. We want to do that for all these other issues as well, right? So we want to be able to, you know, know about petitions and you can sign them, whether it's something you share with your clients or not. Like this work goes mm -hmm. more beyond that, like signing petitions to like in police brutality, signing petitions to bring, you know, the, the cops to justice, signing petitions to like reduce, you know, bail amounts. Like, oh, there's so many different things that I think, you know, if you want to look at it from the impact of the individual to community to glo to you know nation to to global looking mm -hmm. at that type of um impact making sure that you are hitting those levels and noticing mm -hmm. okay what again is it like is my advocacy out of convenience like i'll right, do what right. i can click on i'll do what right. i can click on but if i got to pick up a phone and call a representative i'm not you know those are indicators of like okay know know yourself to know how you're actually showing up for this work if it's like i want to post a pretty picture because everyone's doing it and i'm here for the optics of what it looks like on social media but it doesn't translate into my life outside of social media that's an indicator right, right like right. who are you doing this for and again what's your agenda right yeah so um, I know that we've also been talking for a while, and I know you know you 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 have a little cutie pie to probably get back to, but but I do want to, and, and you let me know if you have time, because before we started, we had talked about this presentation that you had done at the Black Muslim Psychology Conference annual conference, yes. um, and I just wanted to touch on that, but you let me know. Do you feel like like ten ten minutes? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, that works. Okay. I don't have anything until noon. <laughs> Our, okay, great. So. Um, T tell us a little bit more about that presentation and, and a little bit about the Black Muslim Psychology Conference for our viewers who don't know um, what it is. So the Black Muslim Psychology Conference um, is a uh, a conference that's run by uh, Camilla Rashad. She's out of Pennsylvania, um, and she's the founder of the Muslim Wellness Foundation. So the conference is hosted by the Muslim Wellness Foundation, and I believe that it was the maybe fourth or fifth year last summer. Um, I had found out the first time I went. Or or even heard about it was in 2017 and once I went I was kind of hooked on it um, and so after going for two years into, in 2017 2018 I was like okay like I feel comfortable enough uh, and, and not as intimidated with all of these like researchers and PhDs and people presenting um, that I wanted that I had it as my goal that I wanted to present and so um, the theme of last year was the, mis the miseducation of the black Muslim and so I had uh, in thinking about what I felt was just like an important topic, um, there was two. I was like, how people are engaging with social media and do they know how it can uh, impact their mental health? Um, and then this conversation about therapy. So being a therapist, uh, educating people on what is therapy, what isn't therapy, and uh, what are all of the, you know, I didn't do all of them, but like what are the, all the different ways that therapy can look? Because oftentimes what do people think? I don't want to just sit there and have someone look at me while I lay on the couch and talk, right? So okay. um, I came up with uh, a presentation that I titled um, For Colored Folks Considering Therapy When Social Media Isn't Enough. And uh, that's a play on the um, very popular playwright uh, story for colored girls who consider suicide uh, when the rainbow is enough. Mm -hmm. um, and it really just focused on having people recognize one how are they using social media what's their intention behind it um and what's their feeling when they go to use it right because mm -hmm. social media is uh this two-way street you're going there for something and then it's going to be giving you something back and how do you kind of manage uh, everything that comes up and are you even aware of it right so like in a situation now where people are seeing this video that's going around or they're seeing protests bunch of violence are you aware enough to kind of know when social media is causing more harm than good and what might that mean if you find yourself one constantly going social going to social media for connection or for approval or for validation what happens when you don't get it and identifying those things and seeing where if at all therapy might play into it right so if you're someone who's constantly emoting and sharing all of your um woes on social media might therapy be a space that actually might be more appropriate if you knew 
all the things that ther therapy can bring to you. So it was kind of this hybrid. Um, we talked about ACEs um, and uh, the average childhood experiences and that scale and how to kind of know, um, just getting a sense of like, what are some things that's impacted you? How is your social media use either triggering some of this stuff? Um, how is it allowing you to um, hide or escape from actually doing deep work? Because um, oftentimes people are like, oh, I get a lot of inspirational information from social media, social media is doing this. And it's like, that's great. Like as long as you're getting the therapeutic dose, as I call it, of social media, where most things are good, it's pumping you up, fine. This presentation really isn't for you. But if you find yourself, you know, needing to detox every now and mm -hmm. then and, you know, feeling overwhelmed or finding yourself up at 3 a.m. scrolling aimlessly and, you know, passively engaging with it, what might that mean? Um, as well as towards the end, it was a, a, a nice kind of um, deep dive into just all the different ways that we do this work from, like, talking about narrative therapy, Best, talking about you know that there's dance movement therapy and like there's art therapy which I think a lot of people don't really necessarily connect that you don't always have to talk like there's different mm -hmm. ways to do this work well I, I don't think just as a side I don't think it helps that therapists who aren't art therapists say that they do art therapy which takes away from the whole field <laughs> But yeah, you know, that's like a whole nother conversation. Um, but yeah, art therapy, like you said, the dance movement, there, there are so many different avenues that people aren't aware of. Um, but also, you know, and we had talked a little bit about this before, and you had mentioned it earlier on in one of your um, responses that, um, in one of your comments that, um, you know, it's also like, if the first few sessions that a therapist a client comes in and feels like the therapist is not there or they don't understand or that they are you know um looking at them to be the one who educates them about you know the whole system and basic general knowledge that they should already have right that the client it becomes a disservice to the client and them right yep. um but also that how it can affect their their lens like a provider's lens right which you had mentioned before of you know, if a client comes to you and they're telling you that they're going through something and you chalk it up to them being paranoid or them being irrational, um, you've essentially derailed their entire mm -hmm. treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and basically confirmed one of their fears of whether or not, you know, about therapy being effective for them or for them. Yep. Right. Um, yeah. And so this continued emphasis on therapists being aware of what their 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 own stuff and how it's impacting their being for the client, um, mm -hmm. with a recognition that you need to have awareness of the systems in place so that you can understand their experiences without pathologizing them. And I think to have the awareness enough to know, like you said, uh, therapists, we're all human, so we're going to make mistakes, and you may be in a bad space, and, you know, for what it's worth, therapists are going through all of these, you know, global traumas as well. Like, as a therapist, you're also going through this pandemic, and so it is going to impact you. As a therapist, you're also dealing with these things, so you're going to make mistakes, but the work is not in avoiding all mistakes, right, because you can't be perfect, but are you going back, are you courageous enough to go back and do that repair? Are you going to go try to meet with the client and never talk about the fact that you messed up and said this, right? So I think that even if you do say something or you recognize during the week, like, oh, wow, you know, I listened to this webinar and I have said that to my client, go back and do the repair. Go back and say, you know what? I said this last time and I've been sitting with that and I, I want to talk about that because I feel differently or I want to apologize. Like, that needs to happen. Otherwise, yeah. you just you know like you're, you're you're driving a wedge you know if they come back if they do come back and you're doing work with them you need to go back you need to fix it and and then and then use that new knowledge for this continued advocacy like when you find other therapists making these kind of general statements or pathologizing saying something to them that no you need to understand yeah. the context yeah um so this has been i mean this has been i really appreciate you taking the time to you know share your perspectives along with all of your ifs 
like uh, which, which I think is awesome. But um, no, I really, I really do appreciate Fatima you taking the time and you know giving us, giving our viewers, me, other Muslim mental health therapists, other mental health therapists, providers rather, um, this you know your perspective and just the reminder that we all should carry with us of being aware of our own biases and how that's impacting our work with our clients. Yep. And I think, you know, the last thing I'll say is, you know, making sure that you tie your awareness with action, right? It's one thing to know right. what to do, um, but the requirement is to do it. Right. Right. That That's like a perfect summation of this conversation. And I'm afraid if I say anything else after it, I'll take away from it. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm going to have to like rewind this and put this as like the title and, you know, quote you because it's, it's so true. It's the active, you know, part of it that we forget, right? The active awareness. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I also want to just point out that um, in, the, in the future, uh, we do, you know, I do intend to you know, want, well, I, I do hope that we can connect again for talking about the holistic wellness and, you know, your experiences as being a therapist and a yoga therapist as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm letting our viewers know this so you, you all can be on the lookout to hear again from Fatima um, and, you know, um, gain some really good insight for our, you know, therapists as well as about the importance of engaging in holistic wellness. So just keep an eye out for that, inshallah. And um, once again, Fatima, thank you so much for. Um, and thank you, Amna. I want. I know you moved and you left us in Massachusetts, <laughs> but I definitely want to keep more in contact. And thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, your your passion still remains, even from when we wanted to do Muslim wellness advocates to you now doing therapy for Muslims. Um, I think your work is needed, and, and I really appreciate you uh, centering my voice and making it important um, uh, for Black voices to be centered um, now and again hopefully consistently and not just around these issues. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. And that's a very uh, important reminder, right, for me as well, that it has to be consistent centering. It cannot be just during specific times, like what's happening in the unrest right now around George Floyd and continued oppression, but generally it has to be a part of our um, uh, conversations. Um, Absolutely. So, all right, thank you to our viewers. Um, and of course, once again, to Fatima. And uh, we will be having a few other episodes, um, you know, coming up about Islam and mental health and mental health and Muslim um, male uh, and, and masculinity, toxic masculinity. Um, so stay tuned for those as well. And once again, thank you. And Fatima, we'll see you soon. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, take care. Assalamu alaikum.